forgot I'd already turned this off. Uh, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Um, welcome to worship with South Frankfurt Presbyterian Church. And uh, thank you for adapting again to the latest news about how this virus behaves, or should I say misbehaves. <laughs> so we'll mask up for a while and uh, refrain from singing, refrain from social hour because cookies and lemonade just can't get through the masks. And uh, before we know it, this too shall pass. Uh, we'll persevere because we love God and we love each other. Um, we, uh, several of the groups have decided to just suspend for August as, as a precaution. Uh, the choir is one of those, so uh, we won't get to hear them sing today as we had hoped to. Uh, the knitters and the bridge players who come on Mondays I think are going to take a break. I know that the bridge players are going to take a break, and then uh, I haven't heard for sure about the knitters yet, but I think they will too. So uh, this month, I'm going to be taking a few weeks of vacation and also a study leave. Uh, so start, that starts tomorrow. I'll be away. And um, it's uh, been a little more than a year since the last time I did this. And, uh, but there, we've got some good plans for you while I'm away. Uh, I will miss you. And um, but I will be doing some planning for worship in the fall, so I'll be thinking about you a lot anyway. Um, Marty Schmidt is the uh, clerk of session. I should stand and wave, Marty, so everybody sees you. Uh, she'll kind of be on point to, for anything where the elders might need to come together and make any kind of decisions or rally behind a family for any reason. So uh, just keep that in mind. Uh, she's the clerk of session, and we'll uh, be able to figure out what needs to happen if something needs to happen. Um, and I particularly uh, want to urge visitors to keep exploring your connection to this place in August, whatever the additional difficulties may be. Welcome, y'all. Um, uh, this is a, the motto of this congregation is seeking to be a living testimony to God's love, grace, and mercy. And if that's something that you're sensing about this place, we're glad and hope that you will uh, keep exploring that connection. And speaking of visitors, uh, this morning we're honored to have Mr. Tommy Haynes as our guest. Uh, Tommy is just a week or two into his new leadership role in this community as the executive director of RASM, Resource Office for Social Ministries. Um, so I'll, I'll give you a better introduction later during the sermon, and then he'll have the floor. So thanks for coming to this church this Sunday. <laughs> and any Sunday that you can make it. Uh, any other announcements needed for the good of, of all? If not, let's worship God. Okay. <laughs> stand for our call to worship. In Christ we have life in abundance. We thank you, God, for life in all its fullness. 
In Christ, we are destined to praise God. We thank you, God, for the gift of worship. In Christ, we are called to participate in God's gracious plan. We thank you, God, for the good works to which you call us. In Christ, our full inheritance is still being revealed. Let us open ourselves to God's gifts to us. Let us worship God. Thank you, and please be seated. And Margaret Townsley has brought a special message for the children today. That's already on, by the way. This is easy. Good morning. Um, it's nice to see so many faces here, even if you're hiding behind masks. <laughs> when I was growing up, um, I loved thinking about Jesus growing up as I was growing up. And one of my favorite Bible verses was um, that Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. I just think that's a lovely verse. And it comes from a story about a time when Jesus went with his family to Jerusalem, and they were there for a festival. He spent three days with the, with the teachers because he just wanted to learn so much. And they were amazed at how many good questions he asked and how well he listened, how much he learned. Um, and he was only 12. Well, think about 12-year-old Jesus. What would it be like to have 12-year-old Jesus live in your neighborhood, live next door, go to your school? I think that's a pretty neat thought. If he'd gone to my school, there's no question he'd have been the smartest kid in the class. But the Bible verse isn't about just smart. There's a difference between smart and wise. The Bible verse says Jesus grew in wisdom. And I think of wisdom as being a mixture of smart and using critical thinking, using good judgment. So a smart person might look out the window and say, wow, it's a pretty day. Let's go for a picnic and pack and go. And a wise person might look out the window and say, gosh, it's a beautiful day. Let's go for a picnic. I'm going to check the weather forecast first to see if it's going to be beautiful all day or if we need to take an umbrella. So Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature. And in this verse, stature just means height. So wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. And you guys know what the word favorite means, right? Well, favor comes from the same root. So when you favor something, you like it. Um, and the Bible, I think I said that wrong. The Bible verse, the way I learned it was, Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. But that was written a long time ago. And now we would say uh, in favor of God and people because everybody loved Jesus. How many of you are getting ready to go to school? Can I see some hands? Anybody going back to school? Yay, a whole bunch of people are. You guys going to school? Any kind of school? Okay. Whether you're going to school in a physical school or you're going to school at home on a computer, you're going back to school. We try really hard to follow Jesus and to do what Jesus taught us to do, showed us to do. So what are some of the ways you could apply that going back to school? Hmm. If you were sitting on the front row, if the kids were sitting on the front row, I'm guessing that some of you would say he would study hard and he would listen really well and he would ask good questions. And I think you'd be right on all of those things because that's how Jesus got to be so wise. He was, there were lots of ways he got to be wise, but that's a way that we can follow Jesus. When we go back to school, we can listen well and study hard and ask good questions. Jesus was all about learning and teaching. And a fun thing I've learned as I've finished growing in stature is that we can always keep growing in our work to, to be wiser and to be more favored by God and by our fellow man. And how do we do that? Well, Jesus told us by loving each other. Let's say a prayer. Thank you, God, for, Thank you, God. for sending Jesus. Sending Jesus to show us how to live. To show us how to live. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Well, I went upstairs this morning and was delighted to see eight children in the Sunday school class. It's been 16, 17 months since I've had the pleasure of that. And I just happened to get there when um, they were be being asked 
how long is a cubit, to show how long a cubit is. So I didn't catch the answer. Can those of you who were in class, from, from the elbow to the tip of the, of the pointing finger, is that right? Is that, that, that's a cubit? All right, let's see. I don't know, maybe I'm three cubits tall, something like that? Well, I'm, I'm glad to have learned that today, and it's just it's fun to see everyone learning again and enjoying each other's company again. And now school's about to start, not just Sunday school at church, but the public schools and the, uh, the colleges and the private schools. And with all that about to happen, you might be wondering, what's all this on the communion table? Um, obviously, this is school paraphernalia, a laptop, apple, something to drink some water or juice from, and a knapsack. How many of you have got a knapsack? I mean, probably even the college students have those, right? <laughs> That's great. Well, um, in the Bible, it says, show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. So if you're a student, um, please stand. And I realize this is a huge span of ages. <laughs> Um, if you're a caregiver or parent, please stand too. And let me just say a prayer over all of you. Dear Lord, we ask for your presence as we ask your blessing on this school year. Grant these students your peace to conquer fears, your wisdom for their learning, and your love to share with all they meet. Amen. And now, well, stay standing and... Um, you could just put your hand on each other's shoulders or somebody can uh, put a hand on you and uh, you might if you've got a spare hand put a hand on uh, something you brought you know that's school related and um, we're going to bless those all together so now let's let the congregation read the prayer in the bulletin with me <laughs> god of all knowledge and wisdom these school supplies remind us that a new school year is soon to begin. We pray your blessing on them and upon all the students, young and old, as they begin a new school year. Help them discover and develop the gifts you have given them. As they grow in knowledge, help them also to grow in kindness and compassion. Amen. Thank you, and please be seated. And we also um, ask God's blessing on all those who care for students at home, that you might be strengthened to surround our students with encouragement and support and love. Um, now I'm going to ask the educators to stand, not just classroom educators, but also administrators, not just K through 12, but church, school, and college teachers. If you are an educator, an educator by vocation, stand. Thank you. All right. Dear God, thank you for all of our dedicated teachers, for their inspiration in our lives, for their knowledge and their skills, for their commitment to education. Please bless their work. Amen. Thank you. So students, I charge you to enter this new school year knowing that you are enough. You are loved. And you are never alone. May you feel God holding you close at times of uncertainty and celebrating with you in times of success. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Amen. So now, if you are planning to go upstairs for what we call the uh, church, what do we call it? <laughs> I've forgotten. <laughs> Children's church. Uh, <laughs> Um, and then uh, come up here. I've got little uh, blue marks on the floor so you can spread out. And so kind of disperse yourselves across the front, if you would. This is for kids who are up through second grade. The, the children's church is for those who are up through second grade. You see the little blue marks on the floor? You can just spread out that way. Hi, BT. Good to see you. There you go. All right, this is just so we can spread out a little bit. Hey, Beckett. All right, so we have this thing we do when we say goodbye, is we turn around and we say, God be with you here. Would you join me and just turn around and face everybody and say, God be with you here. All right, let's do it again. God be with you here. 
God be with you there. Thank you, and Miss Sawyer will, will lead you upstairs. Bye, y'all. Okay. Cubits. Gonna have to measure that at home because their elbow to the finger is a little shorter than my elbow to the finger. <laughs> That's a kind of a relative concept there. Okay. <laughs> Let's join together in our prayer of confession. It's based on Ephesians because we have been concentrating on Ephesians this last few weeks. Gracious God, with reverent and humble hearts, we draw next to you, confessing our thoughts, confiding in your grace, and finding in you our refuge and strength. We are sorry that we sometimes ignore you when you call. When we could be filled with your compassion, we close ourselves off instead. When we could give, we take. Forgive us that we might be part of your saving plan for the world. Through Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. O oh God, who is very rich in mercy, out of great love for us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, has made us alive together with Christ. By grace, we have been saved. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> Majestic and such a great extension of our gratitude for salvation. Thank you, Roland. Uh, as, as Christy comes forward now to read our scripture reading, would you join me in reading aloud the prayer for illumination? O oh God, open wide our hearts for the inspiration of your Holy Spirit through the reading and preaching of your word. Amen.
Good morning. Your scripture reading this morning comes from Ephesians 4, 1 through 16, which can be found in the Pew Bible on page 182. Uh, Therefore, the prisoner in the Lord beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. But each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it is said, when he ascended on high, he made captivity itself a captive. He gave gifts to his people. When it says he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is the same one who ascended far above all the heavens so that he might fill all things. The gifts he gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and some teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ until all of us come to unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to maturity to the measure of the full statue of Christ. We must no longer be children tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by every ligament with which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth in building itself up in love. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Last week, somebody said they thought this was a camera, so they had to be really (laughs) well-behaved. It's just a little extra light uh, because it helps for the the filming part of of making sure people can see later or those who are online. Well, that was a kind of an interesting scripture reading for a day when we're celebrating children and education. No longer be children, it said, until all of us come to the maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ, it said. Well, Dr. Jerry Sumney says something along those lines that I've been thinking about. He said it during our study of the Gospel of Mark in June. Someone in the class had asked him about the statistics on the declining rates of involvement in churches. And I've heard a great many thoughts about those statistics, and maybe you have too, but Dr. Sumney says something a little different that I I hadn't heard before. He said that, he suggested that churches need to help people throughout life to have a faith that evolves as they evolve throughout the life cycle. He said kind of pointedly, a fifth grade view of God just won't work for many full-grown adults. Well, it made good sense to me as I thought about the mature life issues faced by many of us. And also, I've seen how our own Christian education program helps people deal with Bible stories and with ideas about God in new ways as we develop intellectually, spiritually, emotionally throughout life. So, This is similar to the ways of the professional educators in the school systems for whom we prayed this morning. We do try to keep up with people as we develop intellectually and emotionally. 
But there was only one hitch as I thought about Dr. Sumney's suggestion about the statistics on decline. And here it is in Matthew chapter 18, verses 1 through 5. It says, at that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a child whom he put among them and said, truly, I tell you, unless you change and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever becomes humble like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever welcomes one, such a child in my name, welcomes me. Okay, so on the one hand, the church needs to help people have a faith that grows up. And on the other hand, churches have to help people become like children. Impossible? Not at all. The key quality of children that Jesus was referring to was their humility. Unlike the adults, the children were not asking Jesus who would be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So the challenge is to let your faith grow and evolve without losing humility. And this challenge of learning and thinking and growing without losing humility is mostly just a problem at the very beginning of independent thinking. That's why we have the term sophomoric. A sophomore is someone who's just made it through a year of high school or a year of college and thinks that that means he or she is pretty smart. Light bulbs have come on and suddenly you can question what you've been taught. And that's great, that's necessary. But if you continue to apply yourself to any field of study, sooner or later, you're going to come to against the realization of how little you still know. PhD stands for Doctor of Philosophy, but it could just as well stand for Doctor of Perfect Humility. All you need to do is go walking around in the stacks of any large university library looking for one more authority to quote on a subject. And if you have your wits about you, you will be overwhelmed with the scope of all there is to learn and how much of it you will never get to. But of course, you know, Jesus didn't just want humility in his followers. He wanted faith in God and trust in himself as the one who could show us who God is. And this is where the greater challenge is for growing up to maturity and to the full stature of Christ. This maturity of faith and trust requires adults to learn to use the Bible for true edification, a Bible written in former times by people from storytelling cultures quite different from ours. This maturity requires us to imagine a God big enough to encompass all that we learn through science. This maturity requires us to move past the sophomoric tendency to trust only our own counsel, our own judgment, and value the wisdom that comes from the historic faith and from each other. So in today's reading, the end goal set out for us is so ambitious is to have the full stature of Christ. But there's no need to panic about how impossible that sounds because it's not so much a goal for an individual as it is for the whole church. The full stature of Christ is a goal given to the whole church and not just to individuals. The gifts to the church are that some are prophets or evangelists Others are pastors or teachers, yet others, deacons, social workers, counselors, and yet all have this goal together of building up the church as the body of Christ. By listening to each other and serving side by side, we can avoid being blown about by wild ideas that are just off base. Well, today's reading about all this in Ephesians connects well to our emphasis on the start of a new school year. 
and we celebrate the renewal and development of minds and of the whole person that can happen in the schools. We don't fear it just because it will make the faith life of children evolve. And at the same time, this reading in Ephesians also connects well to efforts to cooperate with other churches because of the variety of gifts that God has given to all of us and not just to this one congregation. A major way that we do that cooperation with other churches is through RASM, the Resource Office for Social Ministries. And this congregation <clears throat> and this organization, RASM, was founded around 1982 for reasons that have everything to do with humility, everything to do with respecting specific calls to Christian service, and everything to do with God's gifts being given to the church with a capital C, not just to individual churches. Well, let's start with humility. What church office, what church pastor, what church secretary, what deacon has not been humbled by the enormity of need that sometimes presents itself on our door, doorways or on the telephone? Sometimes meeting that need is as simple as a church member running some bottles of water out to the sidewalk as one of you did on a hot day this past week. Sometimes it's as simple as replacing the wages that someone lost during a week in the hospital as the deacons did for someone a while back. But sometimes a person or a family can have a big tangle of needs to sort out. Maybe it's a job lost because the car got totaled and now the rent and utilities are at stake. Just as often it's a surprise medical expense. You know, it just doesn't take much for someone to move from being in barely affordable housing to being in housing they cannot afford. The folks in the church office Ours and others are listening hard when this happens, praying with the person, trying to figure out what to do to help. But because we're still also responsible for our regularly scheduled work of the church, well, everything can become derailed. And suddenly we realize how much we don't know about whether a person should call 911 or wait for a medical appointment how to keep that propane tank company from shutting down an account, how an indigent person dog could be put down when they can't pay for it to be done, which office at the utility company might negotiate for a payment, what the food bank's deadline is, what the latest rules are about evictions for non-payment of rent, which apartments are subsidized and which of them don't have drug dealers swirling around them. And on and on, there's a lot to know. It gives us a good case of humility when we're listening and trying to be of help. And that's where respect enters in, to join hands with humility. <laughs> Social work is a vocation to be respected. Ever since the earliest believers set aside a group to make sure that the widows would be fed, the church has recognized this calling of social service. There are people who master exactly the questions I just listed and so much more about how to assess and prioritize a person or family's needs and then how to provide them the practical help that will make a difference without taking over from them their own correct responsibilities. It's a calling. And then, to join with humility and respect, along comes our gratitude that the Church of Jesus Christ is just much larger than we are. And so the question was asked back in the early 80s, couldn't local congregations cooperate to meet the emergency needs of households in this area? We could pool money, volunteers, and expertise. We could still talk and pray with people who call, but we would have a coordinated way of responding without, 
without confusion and, and offering practical help in a coordinated way, but, but more than that, a way that gains real expertise in how to really help people. And this is why Rosam was born in the early 80s and none too soon. South Frankfurt Presbyterian Church was one of the founding congregations of Rosam. And people tell me that Pastor Alan Sorum was a strong force in the early years. Dorothy Alexander said the other day that she had chaired the board, I think, twice. Carol Banks and I are on the board now. Uh, just show of hands, how many of you have served on the board of Rosam? Oh, yes, far more than I realized. Thank you. Well, and on top of that, every time any one of us makes a memorial or honorary gift to the Remembrance Trust Fund that's managed by our trustees and uh, the purposes are chosen by the session, every time you do that, you're strengthening our ability to contribute money to Rosam. This year, we're sending $550 a month. We also, last year, were able to donate Kendall Brown's internship time on Wednesday afternoon. So he was over there learning how this works, but also being of some assistance. So in these many ways, by pooling our gifts with those of the larger Capital C Church, we're attaining a fullness of stature, something closer to the stature of Christ for the sake of God's beloved people in need who are all around us. Well, my latest and to date most gratifying involvement with Rosam was to serve on the search committee that was led to Mr. Tommy Haynes as our new executive director. Tommy has served on the board of Rosam in the past and he knows it well from that angle. But what came through in our interview with him gave us an even larger view of all of who he is and all of his many qualifications. I don't want to get in the way of what he wants to tell you about himself, so uh, let me just highlight three that stood out to me. One is that his first words to us, the search committee, was that he is a child of God and that our faith must always lead us to compassionate ways of helping. Another is that he knows this town and its various nonprofits so that with his leadership, Rosam will be strong as part of a network, not only of churches, but of agencies. And third, Tom's military and other work experiences have taught him some great skills for evaluating and redirecting programs. Franklin County is not the same today as it was in 1982. And the churches are not either. We have, for instance, fewer full-time uh, employees to answer the phones than we did when all of this got first set up. It's exciting that Tommy has the ability and the character and the Christian commitment to recommend changes that might be needed. So, Mr. Tommy Haynes, thank you for coming to talk with us today, to educate us and to inspire us and to challenge us. And I'm gonna sit down and listen. Uh, we have a, a live mic up here for you to grab on the, on the music stand, and we're all yours. Uh, when Tommy's done talking, I'm gonna say a prayer for him and for Rosam. Well, first of all, I thank God for an opportunity to come to talk with you today, because without him, I am nothing. And as Pastor Taylor said, the one thing I tell anybody, when I'm in any situation, when they say, who are you? Yes, I, went to, I was an Olympian. I was a track coach at West Point. I was served in the military 20 years. That's a lot of things, but who I am is I'm a child of God. Everything else is what I do. Mm -hmm. Since you mentioned Rosin, you know, I was retired. I retired from the state, I retired from the military, I retired from competing, I retired from coaching. Retired life was good. <laughs> so why do you go back to work? Yeah. I'm glad you asked. <laughs> God don't let you just sit on your laurels. You know, it was okay sitting in the house and reading my Bible and having my devotion, but it was something just on the inside saying, you should be doing more. You should be serving. Who are you serving? And I couldn't ask that, answer that question correctly. So it's one of those that uh, God has always ordered my steps. Even coming to Frankfurt, 
After retiring from the military, my steps were ordered. And I said, I don't know what you have for me to do, Lord, but I'm here to do your will. And it's one of those, when I got an opportunity to interview for the job, you know, first of all, I told them, if you have someone else in mind, please select them. <laughs> they did not listen. <laughs> and it's one of those that uh, I guide myself from the things that are in the scriptures. You know, one of the things that stands out to me was the, when they start talking about the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And I like what he said at the end, we said against such things, there is no law. I kind of measure myself on those guys. I said, I could just love more. You know, God loved me when I was yet a sinner. Still am, but he still loves me because I'm saved by grace. But it's one of those guys said, how can I love others in that same way? We're too quick to judge. We're too quick on other things. And I look at other things in the Bible, and it's amazing that it's quoted in John about Jesus when he's talking to his disciples. He said, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. By that, all men will know that you are my disciples. He didn't say about the miracles, just love. And I found that love just takes care of a lot of things. And sometimes we forget that fact. And in this job, I see it a lot because I don't consider it so much a job. I see it as an opportunity to serve. And when I hear all these stories, I heard the pastor mention some of them. I mean, they're over and over in all kinds of circumstances. You know what, with this pandemic, it's some people that have never needed assistance and now need assistance. And the first thing we can do is hear that situation because it, go, it has to go through a process. Because unfortunately, we have some people that might try to abuse the system, and that's not allowable because we have plenty of checks and balances. But sometimes we have to deny some requests, but we not deny them, but we give them a reason. And we also said some things they might do to correct their situation. You know, I'm, I've had situations in my life, but it's one of those, my circumstances are never compared to God's power. He can take us through, around, over, anything he wants to. We just have to depend on him. Also, remember faith, hope, and love. And the Bible says, of all of these, what's the greatest? Love. I'm looking forward to moving Rossum in the same direction they're going, but elevating because I look back at the records in, 19, in the 90s, and we uh, served about 7,000 uh, different applications. Now we're up to like 12,000 and growing. And we have to go through those, and we actually do take our time going through and make sure we want to make sure we help somebody. It's a phone call, and I have to applaud your church and the other churches that's contributing to that cause because without that, that many people just would not get any help and would not be able to move forward. Sometimes the only Bible people will see is you. They're not going to pick up a Bible. They, they might not even attend a church, but they would tell through you, if you love them, you can make a difference. And that's what we're called to do. One of the other things that I like about God and his way, he doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies those that are called. I like the way he used regular fishermen to do his work. You know, uh, I had one Bible study and somebody would say, who would you pick out of this bunch of people with all these qualifications? The fishermen were not one of them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's amazing because we look at them differently. God looks at the heart. And I'm so thankful that he does because that's the only thing we can control. We should all be wanting to be the best that we can be at any stage of life that we're at. And two things I want to leave you with is, one of them is, I love you, and there's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> <laughs> and I love you, and you don't have to love me back. God bless you. God keep you. God watch over you. Amen. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, and I, I really hope you'll come back some Sunday when we can have you back to the fellowship hall with some lemonade and coffee and cake and, and all. It would be a joy for everybody to, to get to talk with you more personally. So uh, let, join me now for a, a prayer for Tommy and for Razum. We pray your great blessings, O generous God, upon your child, our brother, Tommy Haynes. 
Grant him perception and perseverance, compassion and courage. May we, his community and his supporters, be ready in our spirits to rally when he calls. May the board and the funders be responsive when he presents needs and new directions. Oh God, we know you want us to help mend what is broken in this world and to lend a helping hand when it's needed. Let us be your hands and bless Tommy Haynes and Razum as they show us how. In Jesus' name, amen. A strange sort of miracle, my bulletin disappeared. <laughs> so I, I have found a replacement. Um, well, I love that. I love you, and there's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> Thank you for that. And I'm just going to echo the same words since I'm about to go on vacation and um, be praying for you all. Uh, this is an, a wonderful turnout today. I hope that continues. You've got preachers you will absolutely love lined up all through August. And now a charge and benediction, one of my favorites that you've heard many times before, also from Ephesians. May God strengthen you in your inner being with the Holy Spirit's power. And may Christ dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. And to the God who, by the power at work within us, is able to accomplish far more than we can ask or even imagine, to this one living God be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations, forever and ever. Amen.